Well, good afternoon, and welcome to our March installment of the Scripture Ministry um, Series, sponsored by the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding. Uh, really happy you're here with us today. Really happy that Mike Ray is here with us today. He's the author or editor of more than a dozen books, including World Without Design, The Ontological Consequences of Naturalism, The Oxford Handbook of Philosophical Theology, Analytic Theology, and other works in philosophy of religion, philosophical theology, and metaphysics. He is the professor of philosophy at University of Notre Dame and the director of the Center for Philosophy of Religion there at University of Notre Dame. Um, he's a really prolific, engaging person, a fine scholar, and a friend. He's also a friend of Trinity in many ways, and we're really pleased that he's here with us today to address the issue divine hiddenness and divine silence. Let's welcome Professor Ray here today. Thanks, Tom, and thanks all of you for coming out and for having me here. I'm really glad to be here, uh, partly because this is uh, a fun talk, uh, or one that I enjoy, and a fun place, partly because when I was in college, I thought about going to seminary, and Trinity Divinity School was number one on my list of places to go, but then I ended up taking a different path. So, but I am really glad to be here. The title of this is Divine Hiddenness, Divine Silence. Several years ago, in a short while after her death, some of the private writings of Mother Teresa were published under the title, Come Be My Light. The journal entries were shocking, not because they disclosed hidden sins or scandals, but because they revealed something far more troubling. They painted a picture of a woman celebrated for her faith and devotion to God, but racked by pain and doubt for lack of the felt presence of God in her life. A woman who sought God with tears and cried out for years for some small taste of the divine, for some tiny assurance in her soul of God's love and presence in her life. But like so many of the rest of us, she received nothing but silence in response. In one of the most poignant passages of the book, she writes, Lord, my God, who am I that you should forsake me, the child of your love, and now becomes the most hated one, the one you have thrown away as unwanted, unloved. I call, I cling, I want, and there is no one to answer. No one on whom I can cling. No, no one. Alone. The darkness is so dark, the loneliness of the heart that wants love is unbearable. Where is my faith? Even deep down, right in, there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain. It pains without ceasing. I am told God loves me, and yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. What are you doing, my God, to one so small? What indeed? What are we to make of the silence of God? Divine silence, or as many think of it, divine hiddenness, is the source of one of the two most important and widely discussed objections to belief in God. It is also, I venture to say, one of the most important sources of doubt and spiritual distress for religious believers. Mother Teresa eventually reconciled herself to a certain extent with God's hiddenness, but moving all the way to the other edge of the continuum, Friedrich Nietzsche saw it as just one more reason to sneer at religious belief. He writes, a God who is all-knowing and all-powerful and who does not even make sure his creatures understand his intention, could that be a God of goodness? Who allows countless doubts and uncertainties to persist for thousands of years, as though the salvation of mankind were unaffected by them? Or who, on the other hand, holds out the prospect of frightful consequences if any mistake is made as to the nature of truth? Would he not be a cruel God if he possessed the truth and could behold mankind miserably tormenting itself over that truth? It's pretty clear that Nietzsche thinks that the existence of an all-good, all-powerful God is flat-out incompatible with our experience of divine hiddenness. But why? I want to spend the next few minutes of this talk answering that question. That is, I want to spend a few minutes trying to get clear on exactly what the problem of divine hiddenness is supposed to be. Only a few minutes, though, because I think we all have at least a basic grasp of what the worry is. 
After that, I'll spend the remaining time discussing three strategies for dealing with the problem. We'll then have time for questions. So, the problem of divine hiddenness. The problem starts with the supposition that God exists. There's no problem for adults about the hiddenness of Santa Claus or of unicorns or of leprechauns or the like. We simply don't believe in these sorts of things. The problem of divine hiddenness arises under the supposition, genuine or for the sake of argument, that God exists. And the problem gains traction because our concept of God is the concept of a being we ought to encounter, tangibly and vividly, it would seem, at some point in our lives. Again, there's no real problem of the hiddenness of electrons. Nobody says, well, if there are such things, why don't they show themselves once in a while? They're just not that sort of thing. God, however, is supposed to be the sort of being who would show up once in a while, but almost none of us ever really see God, hear God, touch God, or encounter God in any other palpable way. Even those who say that God speaks to them in prayer don't usually mean that they hear voices, though some do, or have any other experience apart from the felt conviction that some particular idea they've had is, in some sense, from the Lord. That, in a nutshell, is the problem. Why do we think that we ought to encounter God? Simple. Our concept of God is the concept of a perfectly rational, perfectly wise being who loves us like a perfect parent. A being like that would want to have a relationship with us. And we all know that in order to have a relationship with someone, you have to communicate with them. This is why the junior high approach to romance does not work. You know how this goes. Boy sees girl, boy likes girl, and boy takes every possible measure to prevent this fact from becoming known to girl, or in the other direction. If people never grew out of this sort of immaturity, the human race would die out. It's a wonder I'm married with kids. So it's a safe bet that a perfectly rational God wouldn't take this approach in trying to relate to us. So it stands to reason that God would show up in our lives once in a while. More seriously, the theistic religions are in full agreement about the fact that it is bad for us to spend our lives without a relationship with God. We all know that all else being equal, it is bad for a child to grow up with a fa without a father or a mother, or to believe, for good reasons or bad, that her father or mother doesn't love her. We all know that good parents go out of their way to talk to their children, to reassure them of their love, to be present in vivid and tangible ways, ways that the child can understand and benefit from at whatever stage of life she's at, and so on. Good parents don't lock themselves in a room day after day, waiting for their children to acquire the wherewithal to seek them out. Good parents don't expect that their children will discover their love from them simply by way of inference from the orderliness of the living room and the presence of fun toys in the basement. Good parents go out of their way to say, I love you and to hold their children, and to comfort them when they're sad. How much more, then, should we expect the same from a being who, we're told, loves us like a perfect parent? If one of my daughters were crying out for my presence in the way that Mother Teresa cried out for God, I would move heaven and earth, if I could, to be there for her. If one of my sons were in despair because he thought that he had irreparably disappointed me, I would hold his hand and tell him that it's not so. How could I not? But I'm selfish, imperfect, lacking in resources, short on wisdom, and only human. How much more then should we expect God to respond to such cries? Of course, I don't mean to suggest that God would be bound to respond in some very particular way to us when we cry out for his presence, nor I should think would God be bound to respond every single time. Good parents sometimes turn a deaf ear to their children's cries, and often for the child's own good. They sometimes leave their children with babysitters, even when it's not strictly necessary, ignoring vehement protests, and so on. So what kind of encounter am I saying that we ought to expect? Well, it's hard to say exactly, but you might think that at a minimum, we ought to expect at least one of the following to be the case. First, our evidence should be conclusive. It shouldn't be the case that one can be fully aware of the available evidence of God's existence and at the same time rationally believe that God does not exist. Or, experience of God's love and presence should be widely available. It shouldn't be the case that, in general, people never or only very rarely have experiences that seem to them to be experiences of the love or presence of God. 
And yet both of these things that seem like they shouldn't be the case are the case. It is exactly this that I have in mind when I say that God is hidden or silent. And when I say that people, or when I say that we don't encounter God often in palpable ways. Our evidence is inconclusive. Religious experience of the interesting and unambiguous sort is rare. And it's really hard to see any good reason why God might leave matters this way. So it looks like we have only three options. We identify some mistake in our reasoning thus far. We find believable, good reason why God might remain hidden. Or we concede that there is no God. There's really no other way forward. Now, if you're interested in identifying a mistake in the reasoning, it helps to have the premises of the argument carefully laid out and numbered, like so. First, suppose that God exists. That is, suppose that there's a perfectly powerful, perfectly wise being who loves us like a perfect parent. Second, God is mostly hidden from people. Our evidence is inconclusive. Religious experience of the interesting and unambiguous sort is rare. Third premise, there is no good reason for God to remain hidden. Fourth, if God is mostly hidden and there is no good reason for God to remain hidden, then one of the following is true. A, God exists, but like a negligent father, does not love us enough to make himself known. B, God exists, but like an inept lover, lacks the wisdom to appreciate the importance or proper way of revealing himself to us. Or C, God exists, but is too weak to reveal himself in the ways that he should in order to secure his relational goals. But premises one to four are inconsistent. Therefore, God does not exist. That's the argument, that's the problem. The advantage to articulating a problem in the way that I just have with numbered premises and therefores and so on is that it gives us a pretty systematic way of addressing the problem. If premises one to four really are inconsistent, and I think they are, since our concept of God rules out 4a to 4c, then one of them is false. The trick then is to ask about each one, is this premise true or false? And if it is false, why is it false? In the next few minutes, I'll suggest some reasons for thinking that premises two and three might be false. My own sympathies lie with those who reject premise three, but I'll start with some thoughts about premise two. In St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, Paul writes, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse, and women too, I suppose. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Does it sound like St. Paul would agree with the claim that God is mostly hidden? No. On Paul's view, as some people read it, there is no reasonable non-belief. Unbelief is due to sin. Or a bit more softly, what passes for non-belief is really a kind of self-deception. Being an atheist is like being an alcoholic in denial. You want so badly not to see the truth that you suppress it and convince yourself that things are how you want them to be. This is an offensive doctrine, but I think it has to be taken seriously. Self-deception is a real phenomenon and there is nothing at all implausible about the idea that people would prefer, indeed would want very badly, for there to be no God. One of my colleagues once pointed out that most sensible people would recoil in horror upon hearing that a person of great power and influence had taken a special interest in them and had very definite, detailed, and not so easily implemented views about how they ought to live their lives. Along the same lines, eminent philosopher Thomas Nagel, in a now famous chapter entitled Naturalism and the Fear of Religion, writes, 
I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It is not just that I do not believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I do not want there to be a God. I do not want the universe to be like that. He goes on to say that his guess is that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition and that it is responsible for much of the scientism and reductionism of our time. So is it really crazy to think on the supposition that there is a God, remember, that many people would be in the grip of this kind of self-deception? No. To be sure, the view implies that a great many people, including many whom we regard as otherwise very wise and intelligent, suffer from a kind of deep-seated irrationality. But I don't think that we should shrink from this sort of claim on principle. After all, atheists say that sort of thing about us Christians all the time. Still, this is a hard doctrine, and it has some real problems as a general explanation of the phenomenon of divine hiddenness. Remember, even believers struggle with divine hiddenness. Many people seem to be utterly broken by divine silence in the midst of their own suffering or the suffering of others, or simply by the ongoing and unsatisfied longing for the presence of God. I've seen more than one friend break down in tears over this sort of thing. And remember Mother Teresa. Moreover, many people are atheists or agnostics despite years of what at least seems to them to be honest seeking after God. Is it possible that all of these people are radically self-deceived? Sure. But then we must ask why a compassionate God would allow such pervasive and destructive self-deception to go unchecked. Every day, drug, alcohol, and sex addicts, people with eating disorders and abusive personalities, and many others as well, are made to face up to their own self-deception and admit to themselves and others what they very badly want to hide. Often, maybe mostly, they're made to do this by someone who simply confronts them vividly one way or another with the truth. Why wouldn't God do that for us? This question calls out for an answer as much as the original question of why God would remain hidden calls out for an answer. So denying that second premise seems to me to be just a way of relocating the problem, sort of like pushing around a bulge under the carpet instead of stomping it out entirely. And it seems that the only sensible answer is God must have some very good reason. So now we come to the third premise. Maybe God does have a good reason for remaining hidden. But what could such a reason be? Here I want to consider two different kinds of response. One response says that he does it for our sake. Many philosophers think that, in general, God could be justified in permitting suffering of innocence only if the innocents themselves benefit. The idea is that a perfectly loving being wouldn't make me suffer for the benefit of someone else. And even folks who think that God could allow some people to suffer for the benefit of others typically think that, at the very least, there would have to be some benefit to human beings generally in order for God to be justified in permitting the evils that come from his, hidden, that come from his remaining hidden. The other sort of response denies this. God has reasons, but his reasons are his own and have nothing to do, directly anyways, with benefiting us, which is why we often can't see any benefit to us in God's hiddenness. I'll take each of these responses in turn. So first, what might be some of the ways in which we humans generally could benefit from divine hiddenness? Here I'll consider two suggestions. First, one might think that hiddenness is necessary for preserving the freedom and integrity of our own responses to God. Some people suggest that if God were to show himself openly, we would effectively be coerced into submission. I have four kids, and the older ones in particular, each in their own ways, sometimes try to manipulate and bully one another. Now they're taking Brazilian jiu-jitsu to sort of take it to another level. I want them to freely choose not to do this, which means I often don't appear in the doorway when I hear that the conditions for manipulation and bullying are growing ripe. If I appear in the doorway, they'll be on their guard. The freedom to grow will be, in a certain way, undermined. That's one way of pitching the idea that divine hiddenness might help to preserve our freedom. But here's another. Suppose Bill Gates were to go back out dating again. 
Wouldn't it be natural for him to want to be with someone who would love him for himself rather than for his resources? And yet, wouldn't it also be natural for him to worry that even the most virtuous of prospective dating partners would find it difficult to avoid having her judgment clouded by the prospect of living in unimaginable wealth? The worry wouldn't be that there would be anything coercive about his impressive circumstances. Rather, it's that a certain kind of genuineness in a person's response is made vastly more difficult by those circumstances. It'd just be hard not to think about that all the time. But of course, Bill Gates' impressiveness pales in comparison with God's. And unlike Gates, God's resources and intrinsic nature are so incredibly impressive as to be not only overwhelmingly and unimaginably beautiful, but also overwhelmingly and unimaginably terrifying. Viewed in this light, it is easy to suppose that God must hide from us if he wants to allow us to develop the right sort of non-interested, uh, non-self-interested love for him. Note, too, that if this is God's motivation, divine hiddenness is as much for our benefit as for God's. Which brings me to the second but related benefit to us strategy for understanding divine hiddenness. Perhaps God's hiddenness is good for our souls. Perhaps it helps to produce virtues in us that we wouldn't otherwise acquire. Maybe it teaches us to seek God, to hunger and thirst after him, to not take him for granted. Much in the scriptures suggests that this is what God wants for us. The psalmist writes, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for thee. And the idea seems clearly to be that we all should long after God in this way. Likewise, at one point in the Gospels, Jesus gives thanks to God for hiding certain things from those who are not seeking him. And he admonishes us to ask, seek, and knock. God wants us to be seekers after him. And what better way to cultivate that disposition than to hide? Or maybe divine hiddenness teaches us that God cannot be manipulated by us. That God is not at our beck and call. We cannot summon God by performing the right sorts of incantations. God is maximally free, maximally authoritative, and will be manipulated by no one. This, too, is surely a lesson that is good for us to learn, and so it might be among the purposes of divine hiddenness. Or maybe, just maybe, though divine hiddenness often does have these salutary effects and others, that still is not their point at all. The last suggestion I'd like to consider is one that sees divine silence not as something that is intended to produce some great good for us, but rather as something that God engages in for his own reasons, independently of, though not in violation, of our good. Throughout this talk, I've sometimes used the term divine silence to refer to the phenomenon of hiddenness. I think that that's a more fruitful way of thinking of God's mode of interaction with us. And what I want to suggest is that perhaps divine silence is nothing more or less than an expression of God's personality. Remember our problem. We experience divine silence, and under the assumption that God exists, we ask, what's his problem? Doesn't he love me? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he understand that you have to talk to people to relate to them? What kind of father is he? The objections implied by these rhetorical questions are altogether natural, but they are flawed. They are flawed in just the same way in which complaints about the behavior of human persons are often flawed. They depend on a particular interpretation of behavior that can, in fact, be interpreted in a number of different ways, depending upon what assumptions we make about the person's beliefs, desires, motives, dispositions, and overall personality. Someone from your school doesn't greet you in the hallway. Have you hurt her feelings? Does she think you're a geek and not want to be seen talking to you? Does she think so poorly of herself that she thinks you wouldn't want to be seen talking to her? Is she depressed and having a bad day? Oh, did I forget to mention that she's the class genius, like beautiful mind sort of genius, and she's always off in her own world, introverted and totally preoccupied? Does that change your assessment? You're on a first date. After a while, you notice that you've been doing almost all the talking. You start asking questions to draw her out, but her answers are brief and the silences in between grow longer and longer. 
You spend the entire ride home without saying a word. Does she hate you? Surely she does. Does she find you boring? Have you offended her? Or is she just rude? Oh, did I forget to mention that she just arrived in the U.S. and was raised with the view that if you really want to win a man over, you should be quiet and let him do all the talking? Some people have that view. <laughs> Does that information change your assessment? My point? Interpreting silence requires a lot of information about what sort of person you're dealing with, about the person's cultural background, about what sorts of social norms he or she is likely to recognize and respect, about his or her views about what various kinds of behavior, both verbal or not, communicate to others, about his or her general style of interacting with other people, about what's going on in his or her life, and so on. But if this is what it takes to interpret the behavior of an ordinary human person, imagine how difficult it must be to interpret the behavior of an invisible and transcendent divine person. Seen in this life, Seen in this light, the suggestion that divine silence is in and of itself, I'm sorry, seen in this light, the suggestion that divine silence in and of itself somehow indicates disinterest or lack of love and concern on God's part is absurd. God is as alien and wholly other from us as it is possible for another person to be. So isn't it almost ridiculous to think that we would have any idea what divine silence would indicate? To assume that divine silence indicates a lack of concern for us involves quite a lot of unwarranted assumptions about the degree to which divine modes of interaction would likely resemble 21st century human modes of interaction. Granted, divine silence would indicate a lack of concern for rational creatures if we had good reason to think that God had provided no way for us to find him or to experience his presence in the midst of his silence. This would indicate a lack of concern because it would indicate that God is trying to prevent us from finding him, or at least doing nothing to help, and so bringing about something that is both, very, both intrinsically very bad for us and totally beyond our control. But as far as I can tell, we don't have good reason for thinking that God has left us without any way of finding him or experiencing his presence. I think that we have a tendency to assume that we can experience God's presence only if we tangibly perceive something, a voice, a vision, an ache in our stomachs or our heads, a tingly feeling of some sort. But experiencing the presence of a person sometimes involves none of this. Sometimes it is just a matter of the person being present, together with our believing that she is present and taking a certain attitude toward her presence. Consider, you're studying in the library. You look up and you see a reflection in the window. The girl or guy you've been in love with all year but never had the courage to ask out has entered the library behind you. Without seeing you, she, or I'll just let it be she, she turns down the aisle of books adjacent to yours. Just a single stack of shelves separates you and takes up a seat. She's out of your view, but is there any doubt that you'll experience her presence? And you would, even apart from the initial glimpse that alerted you to her presence, all you'd need to experience it, to genuinely experience it, is the true conviction that she's right there on the other side of those books, together with a certain kind of attention and attitude toward that conviction. In her book, A Wind in the Door, Madeline Lingle makes this point very nicely by way of the distinction between communication and communion. So the situation, there's two characters, Meg and Calvin, and they've gone off into some other bizarrely other dimensional situation, uh, and they're trying to get through to this other person, Mr. Jenkins. Um, and Calvin speaks to Meg, says, hey, Meg, communication implies sound. Communion doesn't. They've not figured out how to communicate with Jenkins, but they're figuring out that maybe they can commune. So communication implies sound, communion doesn't. He, Calvin, sent her a brief image of walking silently through the woods, the two of them alone together, their feet almost noiseless on the rusty carpet of pine needles. They walked without speaking, without touching, and yet they were as close as it is possible for two human beings to be. Mr. Jenkins had never had that kind of communion with another human being, a communion so rich and full that silence speaks more powerfully than words. 
And of course, silent communion is not the only way to experience a person unseen. Think of times when you relay a story about an encounter with another person, and after a bit of effort, you falter and say, well, you just had to be there. What you communicate, I think, is that your words have failed at their goal, the goal of putting us there, of mediating to us an experience of a person we don't see and maybe have never met. Sometimes we do fail in that way, but often we succeed. When you say you just had to be there, no one ever says, well, duh, you always have to be there. You simply can't convey an experience like that in words. Right? We, we get that experiences can convey what it's like to be in the presence of another person. Stories about other persons can mediate their presence to us. They can give us a taste of what it is like to be in the presence of the person. Sort of like memories give us a taste of what it is like to be in the presence of the remembered event, even when we're not. My grandfather was a very colorful character. I guarantee you that if I told you stories, um, you would get a feeling of what it's like to be in his presence. And surely you can think of people in your life who you, you talk about, you tell stories about them, and people get a sense of what it's like to meet this person or to know this person. Not just a sense about the person, but a sense of what it's like to be with them. Again, though, it matters that we believe that the person reporting the events in question is reporting events involving real persons. When we do, we can be transported and get at least a bit of what it's like to be around the person we're being told about. And this, it seems, is what biblical narrative and, to a certain extent, the liturgies of the church can do for us when we approach them with eyes of faith. My claim, then, is that divine silence might just be an expression of God's preferred mode of interaction, and that we need not experience his silence as absence, especially if we see biblical narratives and liturgies as things that in some sense mediate the presence of God to us, if we live out our lives in the conviction that God is ever present with us, and if we seek something more like communion with God rather than just communication. The pressing question, however, is what to do with the fact that God's silence is painful for us. Many believers experience crippling doubt, overwhelming sadness, and ultimate loss of faith as a result of ongoing silence from their Heavenly Father. On the assumption that God exists and that a loving relationship with God is a great good, it would appear that many people have been positively damaged by divine silence. Isn't it just this that leads us to take divine silence as evidence of God's lack of concern? Perhaps silence is just an expression of God's personality, but then the objector might say, God's personality is just that of an unloving and inattentive parent. The problem with this objection is that it completely ignores the fact that sometimes our being pained by another person's behavior is our problem rather than theirs due to our own dysfunctional attitudes and ways of relating to others, our own epistemic or moral vices, our own immaturity, and the like. In such cases, it is our responsibility to find a way out of our suffering rather than the other person's responsibility to stop behaving in the ways that cause us pain. And maybe this is how it is with divine silence too. Maybe our suffering in the face of divine silence is unreasonable, due more to our own immaturity or dysfunction than to any lack of kindness on God's part. Maybe it is a result of our own untrusting, uncharitable interpretations of divine silence, or an inappropriate refusal to accept God for who God is, and to accept God's preference about when and in what ways to communicate with us. And maybe there are ways of experiencing the world that are fully available to us, if only we would strive for maturity in the ways that we ought to, that would allow us to be content with or even to appreciate the silence of God in the midst of our joys and sufferings. Coping with divine silence, then, would just be a matter of finding these more positive ways of experiencing it. It helps in this vein to be reminded of a fact about God and a fact about ordinary human relationships. The fact about God is that the most enigmatic eccentric and complicated people we might ever encounter in literature or in real life are, by comparison with God, utterly familiar and mundane. The fact about human relationships is that experiencing the silence of another person 
can, in the right context and seen in the right way, be an incredibly rich way of experiencing the person. All the more so with a person who is sufficiently beyond you in intellect, wisdom, and virtue. A wise and virtuous person who is utterly beyond you intellectually and silently leads you on a journey might teach you a lot more about herself and about other things on your journey than she would if she tried to tell you all of the things that she wants to teach you. Especially if you got the impression that the journey was supposed to teach you something and that she was leading you past things uh, that you could learn from as you experience them. In such a case, objecting to the silence, interpreting it as an offense, or wishing that the person would just talk to you rather than make you figure things out for yourself might just be childish. An immature refusal to tolerate legitimate differences among persons and to be charitable in the way that you interpret another's behavior. Maybe an immature refusal to accept what is in fact a really great gift. And there's no reason to think that the person would owe it to you to cater to these objections, even if her decision to be silent was arrived at not for your sake, but simply because that's who she is, and that's how she prefers to communicate with people like you. And you might be tempted to object that on this view, God is like a father who neglects his children, leaving them bereft and unloved while he sits in so stony silence thinking, I just got to be me. But to object like this is to fail to take seriously the idea that God might have a genuine, robust personality, and that it might be deeply good for God to live out his own personality. One very odd feature of much contemporary philosophy of religion is that it seems to portray God as having a quote-unquote personality that is almost entirely empty, allowing his behavior to be almost exhaustively determined by facts about how it would be best for others for an omnipotent being to behave. But why should we think of God like this? God is supposed to be a person not only of unsurpassable love and goodness, but of unsurpassable beauty. Could God really be that sort of person if he's nothing more than a cosmic, others-oriented, utility-maximizing machine? On that way of thinking, God, the being who is supposed to be a person par excellence, ends up having no real self. So as I see it, silence of the sort we experience from God might just flow out of who God is, and it might be deeply good for God to live out his personality. If that's right, and if our suffering in the face of divine silence is indeed unreasonable, the result of immaturity or other dysfunctions that we can and should overcome anyway, then I see no reason why even perfect love would require God to desist from his preferred mode of interaction in order to alleviate our suffering. <clears throat> On the view that I'm developing then, it's not true that divine silence serves no greater good. Rather, it serves the good that comes of the most perfect and beautiful person in the universe, expressing himself in the way that he sees fit. This is good on its own terms, and it is justified if, as theists generally believe, God has provided ways, not our preferred ways, but ways nonetheless, of finding and experiencing his presence despite the silence. And if, as I have suggested, there are ways of experiencing divine silence that we would find non-burdensome or even beautiful, and if God's persisting in his silence provides opportunities for us to grow in maturity or in our ability to relate to others, then divine silence might even be good for us as well. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Do I sit or just? Uh, what would you prefer? You can stand or you uh, can sit. What no, would you I'm fielding questions now, yes. right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. I'll just yeah. stay up here standing. Wonderful. Um, if, if I could begin, um, uh, how would you uh, recommend for those in pastoral ministry? <clears throat> Oftentimes when we teach this, it's while someone is going through it. And, and I don't want to say it's too late, but but... A person has different ears then. What would you recommend to pastors or those serving in local churches? How do you prepare people for these kinds of things? It's a reality. It's going to happen. What would you recommend? Yeah, good question. Um, well, so two features of your question. One, you ask, it sounded like you're asking, what do you say to people as they're going through it? 
but then second, mm -hmm. how do you prepare people for it? Right. Right. So preventative, I, if you will. Yeah. So I, I'm no pastor, although I've done a fair bit of youth ministry. But, but I guess I think you'd approach those in two different ways. Mm -hmm. People who are struggling, people who are struggling with this and with the problem of evil, I find it's um, at best useless and at worst mm -hmm. totally counterproductive to try to engage them in philosophical argument mm -hmm. or or even to just sort of you know try to convince them that the objections they're raising against god are somehow not valid objections um i mean really my advice for people who are you know if, like if you're trying to counsel someone who's just struggling with divine hiddenness i'd sit with them and listen to them mm -hmm. um and you know even if they're sitting there just saying i you know I hate God. If God exists, he's a bad, evil father. And probably God doesn't exist, and I'm on the brink of losing my faith. It, that, to me, is not a good time to mm -hmm. say, well, you know, look, I mean, there might be these greater goods. Uh, you know, it could be preserving the freedom and integrity of your respect. Right. No, no, people don't have ears for this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think often the way philosophy works for people they're sort of rationalizing positions they've arrived at instead of being converted into new views yeah. anyhow. Preparation is something totally different. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, uh, in a way, this was my own effort mm -hmm. at doing something a little bit more pastoral yeah. than I normally do mm -hmm. and at helping to prepare people, if you will, to uh, accept or endure divine silence. Mm -hmm. I, it's something that I've struggled with a fair bit, and I, I usually share this when I give something like this talk. I hit on the whole idea here, actually, in uh, observing my own relationship with my wife, mm -hmm. who is a very quiet person, and I'm a pretty talkative person, and I found that often, you know, like, we'd have conflict or something, and she'd be quiet. I'd, why aren't you talking? What's your problem? Come on, come on. Why, why, why won't you speak? Speak to me, you know. And I realized, that's just juvenile. <laughs> I need to just, this is how she is. Mm -hmm. and, it, and her silence is not an affront to, this is just who she is. And I thought, well, yeah, maybe it has application here too. Yeah. And so those, those are the sorts of points that I try to emphasize in yeah. preparing people. Yeah. yeah, that's helpful. I do appreciate too your statement that divine silence doesn't mean divine absence. And, and that's very helpful as well, even though one might feel it, uh, one's feelings are not always uh, true. Uh, they're real feelings, but they don't necessarily match up with truth. Are there other questions or, or comments that you would like to make? Hands, please. <clears throat> Thanks for the uh, <clears throat> talk. Uh, it was really helpful. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, add a question just to clarify. I think in an earlier slide you were mentioning that uh, one option is to appeal to the sin, human sinfulness, um, a la Romans 1, and that's the reason that we experience divine hiddenness. And you, you didn't say that you disagreed with that, but you were leaning towards the third option. And my question is kind of related to whether, whether this view that you, what you've presented, whether it sort of goes with the second option or if it's a view on its own. And, and the reason I'm asking that um, is just two or three places in scripture that kind of compelled my question. So Genesis 2, you, you see Adam, Adam and Eve kind of see, I might be inferring a bit, but walking with God and, com and communing and communicating with him. And then um, in um, Exodus 34, you see uh, Moses, when he had his face was radiant, he would actually, he had a relationship with God where he would communicate with God and then come out and his face was shining. And then when we go to Revelation, um, specifically Revelation 21, uh, like say 21, three, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then um, a similar one, Revelation 22, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God, 22.3, uh, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, etc. <clears throat> it raised this question, um, 
when you're talking about God's personality, are you, are you saying that that's how God is, per se, or are you saying that's how God is, that's how his personality is for fallen people? Because those passages raise the question, is it, is it possible that it is because we're fallen that we experience God that way? And that actually in the eschaton, and had Adam and Eve not fallen, they would have not only been communing with God, as you suggested, but would have been communicating with him in a very free way. I wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, this is, um, this is a rich and interesting question. Um, and I'll have to try to be careful not to give a whole other 45 minute talk in response to it. Um, so I, I guess first thing to note, there's a, a book called The Hidden God uh, by, I think it's Nathan Valentine. Um, he's an Old Testament scholar and he just sort of looks at the different places in the Old Testament where God hides. And typically divine hiding is punitive. Um, uh, so, you know, Psalm 51, for example, the psalmist asked God not to hide, not to, you know, and so on. Um, and you can cite lots of uh, Old Testament verses um, that suggest that divine hiding is punitive. So that's, that's one thought in connection with this. Divine hiding is often punitive. Uh, it, although it's one thing to say that divine hiding is sometimes or even often like this, and to say that punishment for sin... Um, or, as is more the implication in Romans 1, sort of giving people over to their sins, um, is the explanation for all cases of it, right? Um, so people sometimes object to things that I say here by pointing out that, you know, look, there are a number of cases where it seems like divine hiding does serve the goods of freedom and soul-making, right? I'm happy to concede that. What I find implausible is the idea that the entire explanation for divine hiddenness is um, sin on our parts or uh, God trying to preserve our freedom or soul making or even the disjunction of those three, right? I, I want to leave room for the idea that God just wants to be that way. But now a qualification because you point out the bit about being fallen and it, it is important to notice that in the Christian tradition, Sin gets two closely related uses, right? There's the, I have an infant son. He's like uh, five weeks old right now. Um, traditional Christian doctrine has it that he is sinful. He has not committed any voluntary sin, Right? He is sinful by virtue of having a fallen human nature. And there are stories we could tell about what that involves. Um, so there's a bit of ambiguity when you ask, is divine hiddenness due to sin? Um, what I'm most interested in resisting is the idea that it is due to voluntary sin on the part of the person from whom God is hidden. I'm fully open to the idea, in fact, I've, I think I've affirmed something like this somewhere in print. I'm fully open to the idea that um, divine hiddenness is part of a complex set of divine responses to the fall of humanity, right? Um, I, I mean, I guess the typical story I want to tell about original sin is that what happens in the fall is that Part of what happens as a result of the fall is that God withdraws some of the divine presence from the world. Um, and that this withdrawal is itself in certain ways uh, explanatory of why we just can't avoid sin. We're so dependent on God, but how God wants to relate to people who have fallen into sin in the way that human beings have is more in this hidden mode than in the, you know, kind of walk with them, talk with them mode that presumably obtained before the fall and that we're told uh, will obtain um, in the New Jerusalem. Yes, please. Yeah, Hi, thanks for the talk. I appreciate it. Uh, my question is... Um, concerning your proposition about presence and what that entails and uh, the, what's most important in experiencing the presence of a person is the true conviction that they are there. Now, for, on a human level, I know that she's there because I see her walk in, I smell her and she smells good, um, things like that. 
Um, how does that process change when we're dealing with God, um, evaluating the, tr the, the truth value of that conviction? Um, when the problem presumably is the lack of appeal to the senses, um, and is this where um, appeal to the arts and uh, uh, the feeling of the sublime and beauty and things like that come in um, as a sort of corrective for that? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I can't say much about the arts and about the sublime, um, uh, mainly because the few times where I've really tried to think through the concept of the sublime and you know, philosophy of art and stuff, I've sort of run up against walls. Um, but the question about, uh, it's sort of the main part of your question about how this all is supposed to work in cases where we've never had sensory experience, um, that I can address in two ways. One, um, it helps, uh, well, so what, one way to respond is to point out that um, we, can experience a, we can experience the presence of a human person um, whose presence we're aware of only by way of testimony. Right? If, uh, if I come in and you think I'm completely reliable on this topic and I say, you know, look, there is an assassin on campus uh, waiting to take you out as soon as you walk out of chapel. Um, you have to be on your guard. Um, and if I, if I do enough to convince you, right, and if I do enough to convince you that if you elude the assassin here, the assassin will be following you and the assassin will be staying on campus basically until uh, he takes you out, assuming I'm reporting the truth and you are trusting, you know, it's an ordinary case of reliable testimony, I think you will experience the presence of the assassin on campus. Um, even if you never have sensory experience of that person. And we do have, in scripture, testimony, and you know we believe it's reliable testimony. We have testimony from people who have had face-to-face -face conversations with God, right? So that's one way to respond. There's, I, I guess, another, so I guess this is a related analogy because this is a testimony case too. Um, but I, I like this in some ways better than the analogies I used in the talk. Suppose you, uh, suppose you go to a museum and you have the view, however you acquire the view. Maybe you acquire it by way of testimony. Maybe you acquire it by way of some just kind of clairvoyant sense. Um, pick your favorite way so long as it's, a, it's reliably truth tracking, right? Maybe, Maybe you don't even have views about its reliability, but you have no reason to doubt its reliability. You have the view, um, the true view, that the museum has been set up by someone who cares about you and wants to relate to you and wants to communicate things to you by, way, by virtue of the ways in which things have been set up. And the person is watching you as you take the tour of the museum, watching you with delight as you experience the things that she's sort of laid out for you and, and so on and so forth. Um, might, you know, possibly watching with some sadness if you just don't get it on some occasions. Here too, I think, if just, if your conviction is present and you, and it's reliably hooked up to the truth, whether you can prove that it's reliably hooked up to the truth doesn't matter. You can't prove that your senses are reliably hooked up to the truth, but we get sensory knowledge all the time. I, I think if you have the conviction, the true conviction that this is how things are, you will experience the presence of this person with you in the museum, um, even if you never have any sensory experience of the person. Yes. In the opening verses of Hebrews, it says that in the past, God spoke to the fathers in many ways, but in these last days, he's spoken to us through the Son. And as the Christian approaches the problem of divine hiddenness, do you think that uh, the incarnation as the conclusive revelation of God speaks to our feeling of divine hiddenness now? Does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there are a few ways you can go with that question. One way is to say, one way is to present it as a kind of objection and say, you know, look, here you are going around saying that God's hidden, um, but... God became incarnate and walked among us and ate with people and talked to them and let people kill him and all that sort of thing. Um, and I say, well, and if you want, you can push it even further by saying, and when 
he died and then rose and ascended, the Holy Spirit came and dwells within us. Hidden, what do you mean? God's dwelling within us. Um, actually, one of my Catholic colleagues, we recently had a conversation like this, and she said, uh, Catholics don't even have a problem with divine hiddenness. I mean, we eat God every week. <laughs> Uh, we got 99 different problems. We don't have that one, <laughs> you know. Um, to all of this, I say, um, uh, points well taken, all of them, right? And it's never been my intention to, con- to concede to any objector that God is completely hidden or has made no substantive uh, revelation of himself at all. Um, I mean, I'm happy to, uh, you know, I, I believe that God in some sense, well, the scripture says God showed his glory to uh, Moses. Um, and I think that was something like a face-to-face encounter with God. And you know, I think Isaiah's vision was a real, that was a real encounter with God. And I think that Job, uh, you know, there's a real encounter with God being reported there and all that sort of thing. Um, so I never meant to concede that God is completely hidden. Still, um, these experiences, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for most of us, I think, um, the fact of the incarnation, even the Eucharist, if you have sort of robust Catholic views about the Eucharist, um, which I know will be unlikely here, but you know, back at Notre Dame, uh, they're about as unlikely at Notre Dame, too, I think. But, um, you yeah, there are a few conservatives there. Um, none of that speaks to the kind of hiddenness that I think um, people really struggle with and that is captured in this lack of conclusive evidence and lack of sort of frequent, widespread, vivid, knock-your-socks-off religious experience uh, with God. Um, I mean, there are people who, you know, well, people in the Old Testament, uh, some of whom I just mentioned, right? They have real kind of face-to-face encounters with God. Not many people nowadays have anything like that. And a lot of the people who claim them, we suspect other mental problems, right? Um, I've had friends who have very conversational relationships with Jesus. One girl in a youth group that I ran, uh, when she wanted to find a friend in town, she would ask Jesus to show her where the friend was. And what's interesting is she would get a sense about where the friend might be, go there, and the friend was there. So, I, I mean, there's, this is interesting. And I don't, uh, all I can say is whatever she's got going with Jesus, I don't have that. And most of the people I know don't have that. And I, I'm, not, I'm not at all prepared to say that experiences like that aren't genuine um, and in certain quarters, they seem more common than uh, in other places. But they're still, as a general rule, pretty rare. And so that, that's really the main, um, the main sort of, I guess, issue that I'm trying to engage here. Um, and it, it just doesn't seem like the fact of the incarnation or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or whatever addresses that issue. Based on the way that we're framing the discussion of the silence of God, would it be wrong to say that lamentation is always an inappropriate uh, disposition to God? That lamentation is always an inappropriate disposition? Uh, I better not say that, otherwise... um, So to say, when the psalmist lament, where is God, when there's the sense of silence as a problem, uh, not in in a... argumentative sense, but in a pro- uh, sort of existential problem, um, were they misguided? How, how, would you, how would you explain that, maybe, is the best way to say it? Um, my sense of the Psalms, again, I'm no biblical scholar, but at least I think I have C.S. Lewis and some other people behind me on this. My sense of the Psalms is that these are, a lot of these are sort of just outpourings of uh, someone's spirit, right? Um, They reflect, even if, as uh, some folks think, even if a lot of them are sort of composed with the purpose of being used as worship aids and so on and so forth, they still reflect a kind of 
common, honest response uh, or honest reporting of inward uh, feelings, right? Um, which may or may not be appropriate. So, uh, you know, when the psalmist asks that the heads of the babies of uh, whoever it was, the Assyrians or the Babylonians or someone, be dashed against the rocks, I, I'm not prepared to say that that's an appropriate sentiment for someone to have. But I don't think it's an inappropriate thing to say to God if you're feeling it. Um, I am a big fan of honesty before God. Why not? He's omniscient. Um, I, the movie The Apostle, which is now an old movie, but I loved it because, partly because you know, here's a guy who's completely dysfunctional. He, his prayer life consists of shouting and swearing at God and stuff like that. But wow, it's an, it's an incredibly honest relationship with God. And whatever dysfunctions and other problems this guy had in his spiritual life, and they were many, um, that, I think, was admirable. And so I, I guess I think there's always a place for lamentation and a place, you know, if you're struggling with the silence of God, there's a place for uh, crying out to God and complaining about it. Um, the upshot of the talk here is that in the end, you got to be aware that it might be the case that God won't respond to you and God's not responding to you might be because he just doesn't need to respond to you. It's perfectly, you're complaining, but it's perfectly fine for God to be the way that he is. Um, and in the end, maybe you're being immature. Um, and I say that because, you know, I'm someone who struggles with the hiddenness of God. I suffer from these kinds of immaturity, right? I complain to God about being hidden, and yet as I complain, I realize I, maybe I do need to grow out of this, but still it hurts, and I'm going to voice the complaint. Yes, please. Uh, thanks a lot so much for coming here. We really appreciate it. Um, um, being as Notre Dame, you know, you're aware of a Catholic tradition, you know, St. John of the Cross and so forth. And in the Catholic tradition of mystics, there's often was a, an appreciation of going through the experience you just said you had that's actually beneficial for you. In other words, I don't know if you want to say that's beneficial because it probably doesn't feel that way. But it's been part of, you know, Catholic mystic uh, tradition to, to say that. But my, uh, just, that's an observation, but what would you do if, if Jonathan Edwards were here? And I'm certainly not he. But w what if uh, Edwards came up and said, you know, uh, I don't think God has left us uh, in such a situation that we cannot recognize his work, uh, maybe as the way you seem to be proposing. In other words, you know, you know Edwards, he talks about distinguishing marks of the work of the Holy Spirit. So is it not possible for a person to uh, maybe feel that God's not present, but look at Scripture and some of the criteria that Edward sets up to say that God is at work, even if I don't feel like it. Uh, because we obviously are, you know, uh, we do believe in God's providence, and we're, we're, the Lord's going to lead us each step of the way. So there must be some sort of guidance that comes along that's available to us. Otherwise, we're, we're in pretty uh, deep straits. Yeah, good question. I... Um... Well, this, this will be a little bit controversial, I suppose, but um, I guess I, I really do endorse the claim that the evidence we have is not conclusive. Um, it's, saying that it's not conclusive is consistent with saying that it's good, um, and it's consistent with saying that if you've got the right intuitions or the right background beliefs, uh, the, you know, such evidence as we have, evidence from design, evidence from just kind of a priori philosophical principles and so on ought to convince you that God exists. Um, so I'm not totally down on natural theology. I, I, I'm certainly not saying that one can't uh, reliably reason to God's existence from observing the world and so on. But I really do think that um, the, you know, the atheists who look at the world and don't share the right sorts of intuitions and so on to be persuaded by the ontological argument or the cosmological argument or the design argument, I don't think that they are just suffering from a failure of rationality. Or if they're suffering from a failure of rationality, it's more like a failure um, with respect to their ability to experience God or 
it's a failure having to do with self-deception. It's not a failure to appreciate evidence. And right, so but I, I actually wasn't addressing natural theology. I was thinking more specifically, you know, what Edwards talks about, you know, if, if Christ is lifted up, the evil one's uh, torn down and, and so forth, there's certain distinguishing marks of the work of the Spirit of God that Christians often have assumed really would give an indication that God was at work. Now, even though we may not internalize that and feel like God's at work, we do have some promises in Scripture that he is at work. And, you know, Edwards uh, claims that. Now, I, I realize it's subject to uh, criticism, but I, I think, would we want to say that we are a little bit more um, um, aware of God being at work than we're talking about? Yeah, that's good. Um... That evidence, too, I would say, is not conclusive. Um, unless it, it, I mean, it might be that you, um, and I, I don't know exactly how Edwards goes on this, but it, um, but the, this question actually isn't foreign to me. Um, it might be that this awareness, it, if you really start to emphasize the awareness of the work of Christ within you, um, you start to carry this over in the direction of a real sort of vivid experience of the presence of God in your life or something like that. And then, and then what I would say is, well, that might, you know, that might, for the individual who has it, um, be pretty significant and pretty decisive, but the problem is not, not tons of people have that kind of vivid Awareness For most of us, I, I mean, I'd say probably almost everyone at my church, for example, if I asked them what their evidence is that Christ is at work in their life, it would be sort of a series of inferences and, and things like that. Things that admit of, it's evidence that admits of other interpretations and so on. And so I, I take it the response to Edwards would be, that's just more inconclusive evidence and it's great that we have it. Um, but the thing that makes people hurt is the fact that God, you know, as one person put it, as she was, you know, crying in my kitchen, she said, you know, I've served God all my life. Is it too much to ask that he would just once whisper, I love you, right? And, like, I, that's the sort of, that's the sort of um, widespread absence of experience of God that I'm kind of trying to address here, um, which I, again, I couldn't say to her then, well, you know, maybe it's just kind of immature to demand that from you. <laughs> you know, in that case, I just sat there and heard, and, and I didn't have these views at the time I was in college, right? But, um, but so that's, the, that's more the, the problem I'm trying to address, and these evidences, I think, are still in the neighborhood of inconclusive. Could I just follow up just to that a little bit? Yeah. <clears throat> um. If, if I were to push that a little further, I would say, but God has, and then go to the scripture. Now, that might be simplistic. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't mean it to be simplistic at all, but, but you know, God has revealed himself, and he has spoken, though we may not feel it here, but what would be, um, what would be missing at that point to say, and this is love, 1 John 4, 9? or something four, nine, and 10, something like that. Yeah, good. Um, I, I should say my goal isn't to make people struggle with divine right. hiddenness. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, they, they do. I mean, it's just a reality. Yeah. Pastoral ministry, they just do, yeah. I, I mean, the more, the more I push this, the more I sort of feel like I'm moving in that direction. I, I, did, I did a talk on this at my church, and one of the women at my church in the bench, she's just like, God's not hidden. I, look around. I, the, you know, God is just, you can see God everywhere. God's right here with, and uh, that's great, <laughs> you know. And so here too, if, I mean, if, if you experience the scriptures as a love letter from God, um, I, I mean, you can concede everything that I'm conceding to the objectors here and, and still acknowledge that the scriptures communicate love. They're very different uh, for most, I would say for most, even most Christians, they're very different from a love letter or a whispered I love you, right? And, and the difference, again, is the difference between um, 
hearing about someone's love and hearing it from them. Um, so just to keep pushing with the dating analogies, there was a guy, you know, when I was in high school, there was a guy, a friend of mine who was really interested in going out with my sister. My sister was really interested in going out with him. They never managed to go out because um, neither one could, each only had testimony of the other's affection. And both of them were too shy to say it directly. Um, and neither could take the testimony by itself seriously. And it was just pathetic. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad they didn't end up together, but it was just, it was a pathetic situation. But, I, but the example can help you get the difference between testimony of someone's love, which is what we have in scripture, again, unless you happen to experience it like a love letter, which some people do. Testimony about someone's love versus that person communicating it to you directly. Um, and again, what a lot of people want, certainly what Mother Teresa wanted, certainly what the girl in my kitchen wanted was the sort of direct communication that a few people in Scripture seem to be blessed with, but most of us seem not to be. Um, so it, it, if I've understood you rightly, it sounds like what you're saying is silence is always interpreted. So in other words, when someone is silent, you don't just experience bare silence. You consciously or subconsciously interpret that silence. So in the case of God, the question then becomes, do we have a good reason to interpret this silence one way or another? Um, and one of the things you point out is scripture may give us a reason to interpret silence as part of his personality or um, scripture may give us a reason for seeing that he has made himself known in some other way. And so therefore we don't have good grounds for interpreting the silence as, as something that would, neg would count against his existence. So this relates to the problem of scripture that, that you brought up. It, it's, it sounds like what I'm hearing is a philosopher saying that then this becomes the domain of the biblical exegetes and biblical scholars who will tell us why we have good reasons to trust, say, the gospel accounts of Jesus' death and resurrection. Is, is that what you're saying or suggesting? In other words, it sounds like you're saying the domain of the question might be, is it, is it intellectually responsible to allow the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, for instance, to count as the kind of evidence that would give us a good basis for saying, I don't think God is the kind of being of whom his silence isn't, should be interpreted negatively, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I don't mean to be, um, this will sound snarky, I don't mean it this way, but I, I don't mean to be pushing stuff into the domain of the biblical scholars. Um, I, I'm not sure, um, I, I guess I, I take the status of my proposal here to be a uh, hypothesis. Um, and it's a hypothesis that I think is uh, not contradicted by scripture or by reason. Um, and it's one that, it's one such that if it's true, then God need not have a reason that benefits us for being silent. So I, I'm trying at once to challenge the idea that God has to somehow be benefiting us with divine silence in order to be justified in being that way. And then also to sort of float a suggestion that I think has some pastoral usefulness because if, if you actually reach the view that, uh, and I, to be honest, I'm challenged by the fact that I give this talk just about every Sunday when I go to church because part of the view is you can go and through the liturgies of your church experience the presence of God. And so I think if I'm gonna give this talk, I gotta, I gotta be really open to that. Um, and it's a kind of interesting challenge. But so the idea, I guess my idea is if you really come to believe that, hey, maybe it's on me to learn to experience God uh, God's silence positively rather than on God to talk to me if God's there. That can sort of transform uh, your spiritual life. So those, those are the ideas. Um, insofar as those are the ideas, I don't, I don't take myself to have derived from Scripture the idea that God's personality is a certain way. I'm not sure how much I'm not sure how much of God's personality you can derive from Scripture. I, I think that you can derive some. Um, and I think that you can get, uh, you know, if you, if you think, as I do, that the Gospels, for example, are 
historically reliable documents, you can get a sense for what Jesus' personality was like. And Jesus said, he has seen me, has seen the Father. Right? So I think you can get some of God's personality out of Scripture. Um, you can get some of God's personality out of the Old Testament, too, I think. You know, just God likes people like David, right? Um, that tells you something. Um, but I don't know that you could derive so much as to confirm this hypothesis, right? And so, um, so I, I, wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to rest much on the idea that the scriptures give us a very robust idea of what God's personality is like. So much for coming. We really, we really appreciate it. Um, and I too married a quiet woman, so I had to learn the hard way that silence has a high interpretive element. Um, I was curious. I, I'm fascinated by the hypothesis. Uh, where does, from my perspective, uh, the cry of dereliction is the high point of divine hiddenness in Scripture? Where does the cry of dereliction fit into this hypothesis as silence as being a personality trait of God's character? Uh, I like that question. Um, I have no idea what to say in response to that. I, I mean, I, I'm, you know, as a philosopher, given, you know, you give talks and you're sort of trained to have a response for every, it's tempting to just try to make something up, but uh, I think that would be mishandling an important issue. Um, uh, the, the, the one thing I can say, although this isn't an answer, it's just, a, uh, it's just speaking in response to your question. Um, I know that Tom McCall, uh, who, uh, <laughs> Tom's writing on the cry of dereliction. Um, I'll have to ask him about this if we end up going out to dinner or something like that. I know that others, Eleanor Stump is writing on the cry of dereliction now. This is, this is a topic, this is a topic that's been on my radar as a topic of research for basically only as long as, however long ago it was that Tom told me he was going to write on this. Um, and it never occurred to me that it would hook up with this stuff. So I appreciate the question just as uh, an invitation to think about something that I think would be important to think about. Kind of just to contribute to that discussion, I was going to ask, I was thinking of Psalm 44, which is that cry, you know, Lord, you have basically, you're a bad shepherd, you've sold us without a price, and you've basically let us be slaughtered all the day long. And then it's picked up in uh, Romans 8, I know when uh, Rob Yarbrough was here, he called it Paul's life verse. Um, and it's interesting because it's right at the end of Romans 8 where Paul says, you know, nothing will separate us from the love of God. As is written, we are like sleep to be slaughtered. And then he almost takes in this question of divine silence. And he says, this is actually a sign of God's love. We are being slaughtered. Therefore, God loves us. And I was just curious if you could elaborate a little more how you'd situate or how you'd handle that. Um, wow. Two really tough questions in a row. Um, so let me see if I understand the question. Is, is the question um, how, uh, how can we take seriously the idea that being led to the slaughter is somehow evidence of God's love for us? Um, well, this is going to be sort of another, uh, not much of an answer. Um, but I... The main thing that comes to mind is this. Uh, Eleanor Stump is fond of saying, and here I take her word for it because I'm not a medieval scholar. Um, John Woodbridge maybe can confirm this, but uh, uh, Eleanor Stump is fond of saying that the problem, the problem of evil for the medieval philosophers was not uh, why do bad things happen to good people, um, but why do good things happen to good people? Uh, so the idea was, you know, when things are going well for you, um, well, uh-oh, <laughs> right? But doesn't God love you? Um, which is, you might think, a weird thought. But it's, it's a thought that comes from the frame of mind of someone who would really resonate with the idea that being led to the slaughter 
is evidence of divine love. Now, why would that be evidence of divine love? Well, I, I think that for the medievals, and it's not just a medieval idea. I mean, I've, I remember actually this idea of coming out in Sunday school when I was a kid, and it's an idea that I've returned to often. I think the idea is that if God loves you, God will um, mold you through suffering, right? Or maybe the better way to put it is if God loves you, God will mold you. And just the way a lot of human molding goes is through suffering. Um, you know, if you want to get your body into shape, there's not a pain-free way of doing it. Uh, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. And if you want to get your soul into shape, I think, uh, you know, the spiritual disciplines for generations um, have been seen as a route to getting your soul in shape. And the spiritual disciplines involve uh, the deliberate inflicting of certain kinds of pain for the purpose of molding. And I think that the idea that being led to the slaughter might be evidence of divine love fits in with that general way of thinking of, you know, where pain and suffering and maybe even ultimately being led to your own death um, might be a way in which God shapes people and builds their souls. Um, I mean, there are lots, if you just sort of say that cold and leave it, people start thinking about cases of, you know, the severe abuse of children and stuff like that, and they get angry and they say, you know, look, not all suffering molds, some suffering breaks. And then the discussion gets really complicated. So I, I don't mean to gloss over those complexities, but that's the response that comes to mind for, for that question. Thank you, Tom. And this will be our last question. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, I have an easy question for you. So uh, <laughs> I'll right. make the last one an easy one here. First, let me just say thanks for coming. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the kinds of issues that everyone involved in ministry or I dare say life deals with at some point or another. And so having you help us just think clearly about these things is a, is a big help to us. So thanks. Uh, my question is about um, the relation of hiddenness and silence. Early in the talk, it seemed like those were being used, not synonymously, but together a lot. Um, it also seems to me they're quite different. Um, I'm on the more silent side of, our, of my marriage, and my wife has misinterpreted my silence more than once. Um, but I remember this place, uh, we'd been dating a while, and we were on our way, on our way somewhere together, just riding together in a car, just the two of us. And I realized at some point, how good it was that we had reached the place where we could just be silent together and that was a great thing not that don't tell her i said it that way but it was great for you tom <laughs> <laughs> no no it was just we were so comfortable together right but that seems like a different thing than hiddenness and interpreting silence is tricky but interpreting hiddenness seems to be something a little bit different so when you end your talk you talk about coping with silence how would, would you say the same things about coping with hiddenness or is that significantly different or what? Yeah, good. Um, a lot of my goal here is to sort of muddy the waters with respect to which God's behavior ought to be regarded as hiddenness or silence. In the philosophical literature on this topic, it's the problem of divine hiddenness. Um, the only paper I know of offhand that raises the idea that this might be silence is um, Nicholas Wolterstorff's paper, The Silence of the God Who Speaks. And there, too, it's not like he's pushing anything like this line, really. He's just, as far as I can tell, he just sort of adopted the idea of silence uh, for, as something worth reflecting on in a volume that was otherwise dedicated to the problem of divine hiddenness. Um, I think that in reality, if you just think about the different ways in which we experience the presence of people, um, you know, I, I mean, think about whose presence you're experiencing right now. Mine rather vividly because I'm in front of you and I'm speaking. Um, you are probably, even without looking at him, still experiencing Tom McCall's presence. You are probably, without looking behind you, experiencing the presence of the people, um, uh, who are behind you. Um, you know, if there's someone on campus who you have real issues with, maybe you're experiencing their presence. Um, when, when in this, you know, sort of uh, just 
mess of different ways in which we can experience the presence of people. When do we make the transition from, uh, you know, if someone's not speaking to us, right? What marks the transition between their being present but silent and their being hidden, right? One way to hide might be to just, you know, if I like ran out the door and, you know, went out of the hallway, I, that might be a way to hide. Um, it might be that if, you know, if you have a uh, suitable interest in my whereabouts or whatever, it might be that I'm just standing out there and I am in a certain way silent towards you, but not hidden because, well, you could find me. Or that. So the, the lines between silence and hiddenness, I think, are really fuzzy. Um, and I think that the difference between them might depend, at least in part, on the intentions of the person who is either hiding or being silent, right? There are lots of things in my yard that aren't easy to hide, or that aren't easy to find, but that I don't think of really as hidden because nobody's trying to conceal them. And I th in a different version of, um, well, a totally different paper actually on divine hiddenness, I think I made something like this point that hiddenness, hiding implies some kind of intention to conceal, and it's not, it's not so clear that we can, um, it's tricky. Uh, ascribing that to God. I think God does intend to conceal his presence to a certain extent. I don't know if uh, he intends to conceal it so far that what he does really counts as hiding, as opposed to just withdrawing and being silent. Right. Well, thank you, Michael, very much. Uh, let's thank you, Michael, again. <laughs> Thanks, and thanks for having me here.